my dear brothers and sisters, all thanks and praises belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We seek his help and forgiveness. We seek refuge in Allah from the evil within ourselves and the consequences of our evil deeds. Whoever Allah guides can never be led astray, and whoever Allah leads astray will never find guidance. And I bear witness that there is no God but Allah alone without any partners. And I bear witness that Muhammad sallam, is his servant and his messenger. I mean, um, my dear brothers and sisters, I, I feel very privileged um, every time I'm up here. You know, alhamdulillah, one more week, uh, one more opportunity for me to come here and share with you, you know, some of the things and reflections that I've been um, you know, doing on the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, this is a consistent series that's been going on for a while and, and I find that it's a good way for me to connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I hope you find the same opportunity as well. So today, inshallah, I'd like to talk to you about um, one of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Al-Wajid. And Al-Wajid means the resourceful. It also means the great finder. So looking at it from a from a word perspective, you know, the trilateral root word of Wajid is Waw, Jin, Dal, or Wajd. Um, we find this in the Quran 107 times. And of the 107 times we find it, 106 times it's used in the in some kind of a verb, either in the root form or in the present participle form or in a past participle form. And wajd has the connotations of to find, to discover, uh, to possess resources such as wealth, property, um, or to be abundant with wants. So let's examine again, Staying literal here for a second, let's examine the word resourceful from that point of view. So al-wajid, the resourceful in the English language, we find that one of the definitions of the word resource is a stock or supply of materials, money, or other assets. And another definition tells us that resource means an action or strategy adopted to, uh, to um, overcome adverse circumstances. So for us as people, when we use the word resource or to be resourceful, we're talking about someone who has, you know, materials at their disposal that they can use. It also implies that this person might have, uh, you know, the skills and knowledge to put those materials to use in any situation. So let's carry that thought forward. What does it mean? What does it mean? So if you find ourselves in a situation where, let's say, we need to patch a wall in our home, you know, something that we all have maybe done at least once in our lifetime, and it might be some, it might be in an odd shape. So we immediately might go for some tools that we might have in the house. We might have some building materials in the house. Uh, maybe we have you know, other little things to cut the, the, the patch in a way that it actually fits this odd shape. So if we have all of those materials, but we don't have the knowledge or the skills to actually do that work, then by any stretch of the imagination, you know, we're not resourceful, okay? We might have the, the necessary ingredients, but we don't have the a way to take those ingredients and, and put them to good use. And this is not the case with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most resourceful. Everything in the universe in its entirety is sustained and created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, and we know this in many places in the Quran. And one of those places in the Quran is Surah Maryam verse 35, but Allah says, is qada amri, is qada amran fa inna ma lahu kun fayakun. When he decrees a matter, he simply tells it be, and it is. Kun fayakun. There's nothing that is beyond the reach of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And going back to the root word of wajid, the other meaning of the word is the finder or the great finder. Uh, and once again, just looking at it from a literal point of view, someone who can find anything is resourceful. So someone with the ability to find anything is somebody that we actually value. So let's let's kind of look at this from our day-to-day -day perspective. You know, how many times have we asked a family member or a friend to say, you know, hey, um, can you recommend something for me? 
you know, maybe it's a handyman, maybe it's somebody to repair a car, so a mechanic maybe. So if you know somebody and you trust that person and that person happens to be good at finding other skilled professionals, we would go to them all the time. And anytime we need any kind of service or skilled professional, that is our go-to person. So with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's the greatest finder. There's nothing hidden from Allah. So if something needs to be found and somebody can find it always, that means there's nothing hidden from that person. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, with, with him, everything is out there in the open for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So on that same point, the act of finding is an intentional act. Um, it's an act of discovery. So let's think about that for a moment. If we find ourselves lost, that realization doesn't happen to us without any kind of thought. So we must know that we are lost only after we have tried to navigate our way to our destination. We don't just look around and say, you know, yep, I'm lost. And when we do find ourselves lost, you know, our immediate sense should be, I'm going to go ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for guidance. And yes, you know, please, if you're lost, find somebody who can help guide you also in sort of a navigation kind of way. Um, but the same is true when we find ourselves in a state of calamity. You know, we don't just say, oh, I'm in a state of calamity. We have to come to this realization that we are in a state of calamity. And that requires examining our current condition. And when we do find that we are unable to resolve our present state, we need to remind ourselves once again that, you know, in this state of calamity, I need to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for help and guidance. And similarly, we don't find ourselves in a state of blessing. We don't just wake up and say, oh, blessed. We have to recognize that we are in a state of blessing because all of our immediate needs are met and we are free to move about in this world. And this intentional and conscious recognition is not something that we do without effort. So when we find ourselves in a state of blessing, we should be inclined towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give our gratitude. So having that awareness, having that conscious intent is very important for all of us. My dear brother and sister, we should always seek to reflect whenever we study the Quran or whenever we study the attributes of anything that relates to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So these names are just one way in which we can connect ourselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, looking at uh, Al-Ghazali's work, one of his risalas, risalas is a, is a short work or a small book or a, you know, small body of work. Um, he has a risala out there called On Knowing Yourself and God. And in there he writes that the origin of the human being is the essence of angel. The origins, the origin of the human being is the essence of angels. And I had to reflect on that point, you know, why, why, why the essence of angels? And as I read what he was saying is that basically as people, we have a good sense to know that we have the qualities of beasts of prey. We have the qualities of other animals, shaitan and angels. And we as people have the capacity to get angry and argumentative and attack one another. And that is what beasts of prey do. They attack, they hunt, they roam around in packs. We also have an appetite for consumption and copulation, just like animals do. So we also have the capacity to create divisions amongst ourselves. You know, we can backbite, we sow discord, we tend to collectivize people so we can pass judgment on them. We nurture arrogance within ourselves, you know, just like shaitan did. And we also have the capacity to help those in need, show mercy to ourselves and others, and contemplate about the blessings given to us. And that is what angels do. So we have all of these different qualities, all of these different qualities from all of these different uh, creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Ghazali essentially is arguing that as people, the one thing that separates us is our intellect. And that is the quality that brings us closer to angels than anything else. So the intellect separates us from the rest of creations. The example that Ghazali uses is that of a horse and a donkey. So the donkey, as he puts it, is a beast of burden. You know, it, it's, it carries heavy loads. It does work uh, practically all the time. You know, it's not an animal that you bring about and you showcase in the pageant of any kind, but it's just there to do work. And compare the donkey to the horse. And the horse is a creature of grace. You know, you will take a horse and you take the horse in the pageant, you dress it up. Uh, and and it, is, it is just full of grace. It's coat, the way it carries itself. And a horse can run fast. A horse can also participate in warfare. 
Um, we have plenty of examples of that and tons of movies sh that shows, you know, horses in this kind of capacity. So the grace of a horse is unlike that of a donkey. So while the horse can also carry a burden, just like a donkey can, the horse is a nobler creature uh, in Ghazali's explanation that, you know, when you compare them, yeah, the horse to a donkey. So unless a horse does not meet the demands of its ability, or if a horse doesn't make use of its ability, it will be reduced to being no better than a donkey, which is a beast of burden. So if we, if we buy into that premise and we agree that Ghazali's assessment that the origin of the human being is the essence of, of angels, then the analogy of the horse should ring true for us too as people. So to agree with Ghazali means that we must put our intellect to work. So the intellect for us is a resource that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has provided that not only regulates our physical form, things like breathing, digestion, blood flow, etc. It also gives us mere unlimited capacity to form ideas, to think about the world around us, to reflect on the knowledge that we accumulate over time. And that, not just the knowledge that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us through the Quran, but just knowledge about the world and all the different subjects that, that excite us and interest us. And then to be able to spread that knowledge to others so that we can build a better community of human beings. And that is one of the most beautiful gifts that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to us. And if Allah wanted us to be angels, we would have been angels. But Allah Ta'ala has given us capacities from all these different creations to let us know that there's a lot for you here. And if you think about that and you extend that even further, uh, I mean, it, it, just, it just shows the kind of gift that Allah Subhanahu wa uh, Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala has given us. Um, one of the verses in, in the Quran, Surah Nahal, um, verse 78, Allah writes, and Allah brought you out of the wombs of your mothers while you knew nothing and gave you hearing, sight, and intellect. So perhaps you would be thankful. So this gift of the intellect is one that we should nurture always, not just because it is worth the effort or that it regulates us as, as people, but we're encouraged to, to nurture our intellect. Um, in Surah Isra, verse 36, we are told, do not follow what you have no sure knowledge of. Indeed, all will be called to account for their hearing, sight, and intellect. And this is a beautiful and interesting verse for us. So th think about that verse for just a moment here. If we think about you know, miscommunications and conflicts between people and communities, um, we see it every day, either on social media and politics in the news and so on. One of the things we know that Conflict happens when at least one side assumes something about the other side. And because the assumption might be held to a high degree of trust and belief in the absence of certainty, any doubt will cause an escalation of a situation. So if I believe something to be true and it's actually not true, and I act on that belief, then I am one of the reasons why something might be escalated. And in this verse, Allah is telling us that, you know, don't just follow your assumption establish certainty. You have the faculty to do that. You know, we need all of our resources and this includes our ability to hear, our ability to see the limbs that we have to go out and collect the information that we need to collect so that we can remove any form of doubt before we go ahead and act. And once we achieve this, we are acting with certainty in accordance with uh, in the accordance of the Quran, what Allah has told us in this verse. Uh, but also in this verse, Allah has reminded us that we will be held to account for our actions. SubhanAllah. Allah is reminding us on multiple occasions, this is only being one of them. So let's all be careful about what we see, about what we hear and what we think about. Because what we think about and constantly um, you know, noodle on that thought, we will eventually take it to action. So it's very important that you know, we nurture that intellect you know, because our intellect is the thing that makes decisions. That is our decision-making center. And it uses all the information you, you give to it, all the inputs that you provide to it from all the different sensory organs that we have. So my dear brothers and sisters, you know, we are we're effectively two entities in one. We're a terrestrial being and we are a celestial being. We live among other creations of Allah. However, our gaze, should be at the celestial. As Shaykh Ibn Nata'illah mentions in his book, Kitab al-Hikam, the book of wisdoms, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put us in the intermediary world between his kingdom and his realm. And to, to reach, to teach us 
the majesty of our rank amongst our created beings. So we are created to possess um, physical and a spiritual being. We are neither totally physical, nor are we totally spiritual like the angels. So we're in a state in between the two. Everything we see around us has been created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for our use and benefit. In a way, Allah is teaching us that we need to pay attention so that, that we can learn and put these things to use for ourselves. The more attention we give to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the more we recognize Allah's majesty. That's something that you know, we recognize more and more on a daily basis as we, as we grow older. And if we were only physical in nature, then we would be no different from the other creations. We would not enjoy any level of superiority. And this level of superiority, I don't say this in, in the way of um, you know, establishing pride or, or establishing any kind of um, uh, you know, excitement that this is, this is great for us because that too in itself is, is going to cause us problems. But it's because we possess a spiritual side that we can enjoy superiority over other creations. And it's as if Allah has created humankind as a microcosm consisting of you know, both lowly attributes as well as lofty attributes. So we are able to do, uh, you know, we have a large appetite. Our basal instinct will, will give us those things. And, and we also have a large appetite to do you know, good things. So all of those things combined put us in a, in a very special place. In short, you know, we contain samples from various creations from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when we do come to this realization, you know, we begin to recognize how high our status is among all of Allah's creations. And if we accept this position that Allah has given to us as humankind, we should not feel the need to transgress or rebel against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We should feel motivated and inclined to maintain this position, not just for our own benefit, but inshallah khair for the benefit of everybody, all of Allah's creation. And that's something the prophets did consistently. If you notice, a lot of the prophets were sheep herders, for example. You know, that was one way in which they were connecting to uh, creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that needed that, that nurturing. Um, however, at the end of the day, you know, we're all human beings. You know, we will transgress from time to time. And this is just in our nature. We are fallible. We are imperfect. We have the propensity for evil just as much as we have the propensity for good. And our obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not elevate Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at all. And our disobedience to Allah does not diminish Allah's majesty whatsoever. And in Surah Dhariyat, verse 56, we are told, I did not create jinn and humans except to worship me. So when we do transgress, we should remind ourselves not to be harsh. Okay, that's very easy for us to do. We always, we're always in our own minds. We're always talking down to ourselves. That's just something we need to control on our own. Instead, we should turn ourselves towards Allah SWT and ask for guidance and mercy. And we live in a time when more and more communities of people claim that they want to live secularly. And the definition of secular in the context of, of a community is that it is free of any religious or spiritual basis, meaning there is no room for God. And meaning there is no room or anything that would be representative or any activities that would be representative of that. So because we do live in this secular society, we do have certain accommodations that have been made over the course of time. But more and more, at least just as an observation from my point of view, it seems like those institutions are always uh, under attack in some way or form. And the opposite of secular is sacred. And the definition of sacred in the context of community is to be connected with God or dedicated to a religious purchase, purpose. You know, given the time, you know, we find ourselves where people ascribe importance to material gains and consumerism and then, you know, and then connecting themselves to the divine as kind of an afterthought. Uh, you know, for some people, maybe after calamity, that's how they find themselves reconnecting themselves with the creator. But until then, you know, they're just all about whatever's around them, getting the work done, buying things and living. And it's almost like they're in emotion. And we're warned about this in the Quran as well. You know, in Surah Al-Balad, verse number four, we are told, uh, Indeed, we have created humankind in constant struggle. Constant struggle. Um, you know, we're so busy every day. We're always struggling to find time. We're always struggling to find that balance, what we call work life between our personal and our professional lives. That causes, in turn, a struggle for us to be able to pray on time. How many times have we found ourselves where 
oh my gosh, I missed Dohar prayer because I was in a meeting. Um, I know I found myself from time to time in that situation, sometimes even more regularly than I'd like to. And, and sometimes we have other obligations that need to be met and that gets in the way of our you know, obligations or our commitment to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So just having that constant reminder with ourselves is, is a struggle. You know, we're impatient to act quickly. We want to do things fast. We want to be able to meet those deadlines and then get away from the pressures that we feel from the deadline only to realize deadlines are never ending. They're just constantly there. So Allah is warning us about this in the Quran as well. And another place where Allah warns us about this is in Surah Al-Maraj, uh, verse 19 to 21. And indeed, humankind was created impatient, distressed when touched with evil and withholding when touched with good. And in this chapter, Allah, or in this verse that follows after this, Allah is talking about um, how we give less when we have more uh, as one way in which we uh, feel like we need to hang on to things because we might not have it again. Uh, so inshallah, may Allah elevate our understanding of the Quran so that you know we may begin to and continue to live our lives under the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And may Allah increase us in knowledge and give us wisdom. That is, give us the ability to apply this knowledge when we need it the most. So inshallah, khair, I hope you benefit from uh, this reminder. My dear brothers and sisters, you know, let's make uh, let's pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah guides our hearts towards him and may we find ourselves uh, seeking strength and staying strong on the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And may Allah forgive all our shortcomings. Rabbana habdana min azwajina wa zuriyatina kurata iwani wa jalla la mutakina imama. Rabbana faqfilan azlubina wa kafir anna. Thiyatina wa tuwafa ama abarar. Rabbi jalli mukim wa salati wa min zuriyati. Rabbana wa takabal dua. Rabbana khfirli wa li walidiya wa lil mu'minina. يوم يقوم الحساب ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا وحب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوحاب ربنا عليك توكلنا وإليك أنبنا وإليك المصير ربنا لا تجعلنا فتنة للذين كفروا واغفر لنا ربنا إنك أنت العزيز الحكيم ربنا لا زلمنا إن أنفسنا وإن لم تغفر لنا وترحمنا إنك من الخاسرين ربنا آمنا فاغفر لنا وارحمنا وأنت خير الرحمين إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعزكم لعلكم تذكرون لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إني كنت من الظالمين سبحان ربك رب العزة يما يسيفون السلام للمسلمين الحمد لله رب العالمين آمين الله bless this Jum'ah for you and may you all have a blessed weekend آمين الله أكبر